Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. beginning a, a campaign this morning to raise some funds uh, for the renovations that are going to go on um, at the, the building. And we're excited about space. Uh, I know that you're just as excited about space um, as I am. I typically have quite a bit of space in the front row. No one wants to sit with me. I don't know why. Um, and I typically sit next to people that I know. I know that you're sitting next to people that you don't, um, and and probably excited about a little bit of space. I am too. Um, The cool part is is that that this is not just um, any space. Uh, We feel very excited um, to step in to um, the space that Saviors has been working hard to prepare for the last 14 years, and feel very privileged to worship Jesus at the center of our city in what I believe is the best sanctuary in our city. It's just such a cool space. So there are some changes that need to happen um, to the to the planing mill, which is where they meet, and to the building next door. Um, if you've not, if this, if you're new here and you didn't even know we were moving, let alone where we're moving, um, we're moving. And this is where, allow me to take you on a virtual tour. This is the uh, outside of the sanctuary. Uh, if you didn't uh, pick this up, that's a children's play area, the colorful part. And um, if your children are under the age of three, then they'll actually be in classrooms that are in the sanctuary. This building's, uh, I think, a little over 10,000 square feet. And so if you could go to the next slide, uh, this is where we'll meet with some renovations and some new bathrooms. Um, the city has told us that we can be 505 people in this space so there is some room to grow the next slide um, this is from the other angle there'll actually be a, a foyer wall going in some demo of one of the children's rooms and some new bathrooms um, so that you know one of the things that radiant and saviors had in common is that we both stand in line at the bathroom so that's one of the things we share together we're together in that um, and so there'll be some new bathrooms going in. The next slide, please. Uh, this is currently used for ministry and offices. Um, some of the ministry that goes on in there is children's ministry. They were also allowing other churches to meet in there. Um, and we'll actually be demoing the inside, which actually that uh, we're in the process of that right now, and making that entirely children's classrooms with the exception of a kitchen uh, that's in there. Um, because at one point it was sombreros, which was a Mexican food uh, place. So there's a wonderful, wonderful commercial uh, kitchen that will be connected to some kids' classrooms. So if your kids are f- ages four and up, you'll be walking them across the parking lot to our kids' uh, building. And next slide, please. And this is these are our offices. Um, uh, Harry uh, Weiss is at work in there creating some space for us. Also, I I think some of our older kids will be meeting in a loft space to have some conversation and connect on Sunday mornings, Um, as well as the RSOM uh, will be happening in this uh, building. It is strategically placed next to Phillies and the (laughs) planning mill pizza place. So we were like, where can the offices go? As close to Phillies. (laughs) as possible. So I wish that it was more spiritual than that. I wish that the Lord spoke to us in a dream. He didn't. It's as close to Phillies as we can get. Um, uh, You know, what I want to say is something that we've we've said before. So this is probably for many of you just a reminder. Um, If you're new here, it may feel like an invitation for the first time. Um, But Really, if, if, if you see value 
in what we're doing or if you've benefited from being together with this community, if you've benefited from being a part of this family, we're asking you to help us. We're asking you to make sacrifices so that we can grow this family. If you know someone who needs to belong, who needs to know Jesus, don't you dare tell me that this church is too big when you still have unsaved family members and neighbors. This church will be too big when you don't have unsaved neighbors and family members. And right now what we're asking you to do is to make sacrifices to provide for somebody else, to join us in creating space, not just join us in taking space. The truth is, is that you're here because someone else provided for your seat. You enjoy uh, what you enjoy here. You experience what you experience here because a few people made some pretty significant sacrifices and we do it because we're excited about it. We don't do it because we have to. We do it because it's a huge blessing. I haven't gone to church in a really long time and I couldn't be happier. I really enjoy serving here and making sacrifices to see this thing go forward. It really is, as Jared said, the best place to be in this church is not just loosely connected, but a place where you're committed to the mission and vision uh, that we're moving uh, into. So my invitation to you would be buy somebody's seat. Help us to create space. If you know people who need to be a part of God's family and specifically this family, would you join us in creating community? Everybody is psyched out of their mind about the church growing. I've not met one person who's like, yeah, you know, I don't know. Everyone's very excited about the church growing. The question is, can it grow through you? Can it grow through you? Will you make the sacrifices? Will you make time in your life for new people? Will you give up the things that you enjoy? Will you serve one service and attend the other? Will you join us on mission together? It really is the best place to be. Um, I, it, 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 it creates so much community for us to team up together. I, I liken it to this, you know, as a team, if all we do is practice and we never face an opponent, you know, things get, you get pretty irritated with your teammates, right? If it's just preseason and we don't ever kick off, sorry, they'll be full of football analogies today. If all we do is practice together, we don't actually take on an opponent, you can start to get annoyed with the people that you're with. But when we face an opponent together, when we team up, when we take a hill, when we charge together, something happens. And so would you join us in that? We'd love for you to pray. We'll be raising money for the next I don't know how long. Um, we'll be raising money for the next two weeks in Jesus' name. Uh, no, don't do that to me. That was not. Um, we'll be raising money for some time. So pray. Consider how you would partner uh, with us. Um, pray and consider the sacrifices you'd make um, to make some space for someone else to be a part of what's going on here. Uh, the truth is, I'm not sure you probably do want to know this. The truth is, is that we could sell this property and there's enough equity in this property for us to pay for the renovations at the next building. There's a couple hundred thousand bucks in equity in this building that we purchased a couple years ago. But as we've prayed, sought the Lord, we believe that we're supposed to hold on to this building. Uh, we believe it's in a fantastic spot. Um, we believe that it is strategically placed for all kinds of ministry. And we really believe that with what we have here, we can help support or launch young churches. We feel like we can help support and launch ministries. We feel like we can start things that will have a significant impact on this neighborhood. So as we've prayed about hawking this thing, using the money to renovate, we really believe that what we'd rather do is keep this thing, launch ministries from it, and raise the money to do the renovations. We can finance some of the renovations, um, but we will work um, to keep this church as far out of debt as possible so that we can continue to spend money on ministry and not a mortgage. Everyone got it? All right, you got a Bible? Open it to Mark chapter 5. If you don't know where the book of Mark is and you've got a Bible, 
the first thing God wrote was a table of contents at the beginning of your Bible. <laughs> so you can look at the table of contents and find the book of Mark. In the beginning was the table of contents. <laughs> Man, I feel like I've said two dumb things already. All right. Hey, so for the next eight weeks, I'm going to talk about the vision and, and values of Radiant Church. And my hope is that I will clearly mark the front of the bus so that you know where we're headed and how we're going to get there so that you can decide if you want to hop on that bus. And finding language, examples, um, pictures that clearly communicate what God's put in our hearts to do is tough. Have you ever struggled to find language, pictures, or examples, you know, that communicate kind of what God's put on your heart? It's pretty difficult. Maybe it's not for, for you. It, it was for me. And um, it, 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 it takes many times an outsider to help you understand what's distinct about your family. We call that marriage. Right? The outsider comes in and they say, why does your dad do that? <laughs> and then you say, do what? Uh, that. Well, I don't know what that is because that is the way my dad is, you know? Sorry, there's nothing personal about this. I have to watch what I say I've got rich artists and rich Aiklin <laughs> here. So, but it takes an outsider looking in going, hey, how come, how come you guys make tuna that way? You know, they, they notice things because families are unique and distinct in some ways. And, and, and because you're so close to your family, I think sometimes we miss what makes our family unique and distinct. And sometimes it takes an outsider to notice those things. Different families um, celebrate in different ways or don't celebrate for that matter. You know, uh, well, Christmas is a huge deal in my house. Well, Christmas isn't such a big deal, right? Uh, different um, families do traditions in, in different ways. Um, different families have, have different, a different sense of humor. Have you ever seen that before where... You know, a family thinks a certain thing or certain types of movies are funny and you're like, I don't get it. I don't get what's so funny about this. Um, I think, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but certain families have certain smells. I'm not joking. Not in a bad way. But you walk into their house and there's a certain smell. It's distinct. It's unique. It's not just that way with um, homes. It's that way with cars. Taylor's car smells. Like, I could tell you right now, if you put it in front of my nose, that is the smell of Taylor's car. I can't describe it. It's not a bad smell in Taylor's defense, but there's a smell to Taylor's car. So there's something unique and distinct, and sometimes we don't notice our own smells. We don't notice our own jokes. We don't notice the way that our mom prepares tuna. So what is distinct? What is unique? In many ways, we're a family. We're just a church like any other church, but there are some unique and distinct things that Jesus has called us to do, and I've just been living in the question, what is that? Like, what is it? Because more and more people are joining, and I want to be really clear about where we're going um, so that I can enroll people into what we're up to. So for the next eight weeks, we're going to be unpacking a mission, vision, statement for Radiant Church um, that you've heard before, um, but we've built out um, to tackle some new things. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the next eight weeks is that we want to behold Jesus. That's just a Christianese word for look to or gaze at Jesus. And we want to put his brilliance on display. You've heard this before. But how specifically will we put the brilliance of Jesus on display? We believe that we've been called to live lives, live lives that are obedient to the word of God, surrendered to the spirit of God, and devoted to the mission of God. That's what we want to do. We want to put his brilliance on display by being obedient to his word. Jesus, of course, is our model for that. We want to be surrendered to his spirit. Again, Jesus is, of course, our model for that. 
If your model for what it looks like to be spirit-filled is not Jesus, you have the wrong model, okay? So we also want to be devoted to his mission. We want to seek. We want to serve. We want to share. These are things that we want to do. But we want it. We believe that living lives that are obedient to word, surrendered to the power of his spirit, devoted to his mission, that should, it should result in some things. Or there's an in order that. And the things that we're excited about here are the lost being found, prodigals coming home, disciples being made, and churches being planted. And I could cry right now talking about those things. Is there anything better than someone lost? Like lost. And, and they didn't find God, but God found them. And you were a part of that. Is there anything better than seeing a prodigal come home? Come on, parents. Is there anything better than that? Is there anything better than seeing a disciple made, not just someone following Jesus from a distance, but actually stepping in and doing what Jesus has asked them to do? Is there anything better than that? And is is there anything better than that happening in the context of a local church? Absolutely not. Jesus told his disciples to go make disciples, and they planted churches because planting churches is the best way to make disciples. Okay. <laughs> okay, so All right, so here's the deal. <clears throat> I had to uh this week uh resist the temptation to jump ahead. Because when I start talking about what I'm going to do or being obedient to words, surrendered to spirit, devoted to mission, so that these things happen, I mean, I really get excited. And part of me, honestly, this week as I thought about preaching was thinking, I'd rather talk about those things. I don't want to talk about beholding Jesus. I don't want to talk about seeing, yeah, 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 seeing Jesus, sure, seeing Jesus, but this is what we're going to do. And honestly, I don't know if you've ever had to resist the temptation of jumping ahead, but I feel like I had to resist the temptation of jumping ahead. Because the truth is, is that to talk about the way we behave or what we're going to do without first talking about what we believe and what we see about Jesus is a fat waste of time. It is. We have to have that. We, we can't be a radiant church. We can't reflect something that hasn't first been revealed to us. Good luck living those things. Good luck living obedient to his words, surrendered to his spirit, devoted to his mission without first seeing Jesus and beholding him. Right? I feel really tempted in Paul's letters to jump ahead. Have you ever noticed this about Paul's letters? They always start with talking about Jesus, right? And it's like, this is what Jesus has done. And these are the treasures we have in Jesus. And this is why Jesus is amazing. And this is why the gospel is so amazing. And this is the foundation that we have. And isn't this so amazing? And then very late in his letters comes this hinge where he says, therefore, or so, in light of what I just told you about how amazing Jesus is, you should live your life like this. But many of us jump right to the back of those books because we want to talk about our marriages and we want to talk about our relationships and we talk about you know, how are we going to be obedient to the word and how are we going to be devoted to the mission. And I don't know about you guys, but you know where those are at. You read Ephesians and it's all about what Jesus has done. And then you get to this point where it's like, so... Your marriage should look like this. So your relationships should look like this. So the gifts should operate like this. And it's like we want to just run to that place where it's about us. What is it about us that wants to make everything about us? What is that? What is that? What is that in me that just wants to jump? I, Hebrews is like the, the worst. Romans is a bad example of this too. I mean, you read 10 pretty confusing chapters about how amazing Jesus is, how he's 
the Son of God, but He's still man, and He's better than angels, and He's, you know, a greater sacrifice. And that's why this old sacrificial system doesn't work, because Jesus is so amazing. And then it starts to turn the corner, and we're all familiar with chapter 12, 13, where it says, so then, right? So this is kind of, or in Romans, it's like, so in light of God's mercies, the mercies that we just talked about for 10 chapters, let's for just a few chapters talk about how we should live our lives, but we want to talk about how we should live our lives without first talking about Jesus, without first beholding Jesus. It's about Jesus. If you're reading your Bible, looking for things that you should do or trying to find yourself in those pages, you're reading it wrong. It's not about you. It's not about you living your best life now. It's not even primarily about the principles we glean from it. It's about Jesus. It tells us about Jesus. And if you're coming to it like it's supposed to show you yourself, you're coming to it wrong. It's like uh, the last day of school. You get your yearbook and you flip it open to the back. You find your name. You find out how many pages you're on. 14, 22, 64, that's not bad. Three pages, it's better than my sophomore year. I was only on one page. I'm moving up in the world. And then you scroll down and there's that popular person and they're on like 45 pages in the yearbook as if the point of the yearbook is you. Photos of you. Some of you are reading the Bible that way. It's not about you. This book is about Jesus. It's about what he's done and what he's revealed to us. Resist the temptation to jump forward. I'm preaching to myself right now. Resist the temptation to jump forward. In conversation with Tiffany, sometimes she'll start talking to me. She's telling a story and I'm thinking, what does this have to do with me? So I just stop her and I'm like, what do I have to do with this? (laughs) What, What does this mean in my life, you know? It's like this is what we do as human beings. And unfortunately, this is the way we come to Scripture. This is the way we come to church. This is the way we come to our relationships. Stop that. That's not the way that Jesus came to us in the gospel. And that's why Paul spends all this time. This is how Jesus comes. This is how Jesus comes in the gospel. This is how it should shape you. Because if, if we're honest... The way we behave is is, is rooted in and based on things that we believe. And what we believe lies buried under a bunch of Christian jargon you've learned to recite. Oh, God's for you. You know, like you could say it all right now. I don't think you believe it. Want to know why? Because of the way you behave. I don't know where I'm at. So, it is about Jesus and we can't skip forward. We get to talk about seeing Jesus, beholding Jesus. And we come together as Radiant Church and we open the Word of God because we see Jesus in Scripture. We come together and we worship. We declare the truth of who God is and we surrender our lives to Him. We come together and we come to the table and we remember Christ's body broken for us, his blood shed for us, and we, we turn to God in prayer together because we behold, we see Jesus in that place where we're communicating to him. But let me, let me tell you this, we do not gather to the scriptures, we do not gather to worship, we do not gather to communion, and we do not gather to prayer, we gather to Jesus And we meet Jesus through communion. We meet Jesus through the scriptures. We meet Jesus as we worship together. And we meet Jesus as we pray. Okay, so when we open our Bibles, we're not just looking to talk about him. We actually want to taste and see that the Lord is good. Your words, they're like this. We, I, when, when I say we want to see Jesus, know that I mean more than we want to see Jesus. Like Isaiah meant more than Isaiah, chapter 6. He has this visitation, this encounter, and he says, I saw the Lord. And I think we all know what someone means when they say, I saw the Lord. 
They mean exactly what Jared prayed earlier. I'm wrecked. I'm changed. I'm transformed. Just to see you is to change me. We're not talking about, well, we just want to get together. We want to talk about Jesus and then we'll remember what he did. No, we actually want to encounter him through these things. We actually come together to experience him. The reason, and I'll say it, I guess I'll say it again. I'm, I'm sure I've already touched on this. The reason that we have to start here in this place of beholding Jesus is that you will become like what you behold. The God you see is the Christian that you'll be, so it's really important that you see Him rightly. Really, really important. Tozer says it's the most important thing about you. And you know this, an angry Christian sees an angry God. That's what you see. As you grabbed the bulletin when you walked in and there's a bunch of different pictures of Jesus on the front. The one that looks like a mug shot is certainly not him. I do not <laughs> worship that man. Who do you see? Because as Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3 says this, and we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image. You will become like what you behold. The God you see is the Christian that you'll be. It's really important that we start here. I don't want to just talk about your behavior without talking about what you, what you believe about God that's leading you to behave the way you behave. If you're having a hard time cutting a big check for the offering, it has nothing to do with money. You don't trust Him. You don't. I don't know what you think about Him. I don't know what you see. I don't know what fears you have. I don't know what disappointments you're wrestling with. But you don't see a God who can be trusted. It has nothing to do with funds. Your money has nothing to do with money. So why? I mean, I, mean, I, I want to break these things down and not take anything, I guess, for granted. But, but like, why do we want to experience Jesus? Why do we want to encounter him? Why do we want uh, His touch in our lives? What difference does it make? Why can't we just attend an event? Why can't we just come to church? Why can't we just talk about Him? What are you even talking about, Travis, when you talk about experiencing Jesus? I want to touch on three things. It's a sermon, so it has to be three things at all times. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a sermon. If it was four things, it wouldn't be a sermon. Two things, it's not a sermon. Three things, you've got yourself a sermon. Something happens. You, you know it. I, I don't even have to say it. Something happens when we encounter Him. Something happens when we experience Him. Something happens when He speaks to us. Something happens happens when God the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus. I don't know how to explain it. I experienced it uh, yesterday and it just, it changes things. His touch in our lives changes us. His words to us change us. We're not the same uh, when we get around Him. And there are there's story after story after story in your Bible of God revealing himself to people and their lives being radically transformed. That's, I want to say that's all it is. I know it's more than that. I'm just exaggerating. But it really does feel like one story after another, God encountering his people and changing them. So I want to read one story to you, make a couple comments, and hopefully encourage you to experience Jesus and to know what will shift when you encounter or experience um, Jesus in your uh, life. It comes from Mark chapter 5. A large crowd followed Jesus and pressed around him. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had Yet instead of getting better, she grew 
worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him and the crowd touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt it in her body uh, that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? And the disciples say, you see the crowd of, you see the people crowding against you? And yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came, fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Jesus, I know that you did this. Um, I'm thankful uh, for these um, stories, uh, these encounters that we read about, but I, I want to pray that you'd meet us here today. Thank you that you still do this. You still heal. Um, you still show compassion on people. You still stop what you're doing to tend and to speak to us. So I just ask that we wouldn't just read about what you do once did, but that we would experience what you're doing uh, in and around us. Amen. Hey, I want to start, you know, actually, uh, before we talk about what happens when you experience or encounter Jesus, I just want to talk, just just mention briefly how profound it is that we can encounter or experience Jesus. Okay, don't miss that, because I think we think we're like entitled, you know, like we're dealing with some sort of genie here who, why wouldn't he respond to me, you know, that type of attitude, get right out of town, man, it's amazing, it's amazing, not just what happens when we encounter or experience Jesus, but just simply that we can touch him. I mean, isn't that the big idea of Jesus, Emmanuel, right, God with us. John says that he uh, made his dwelling among us, that Jesus moved in, that Jesus came close, that Jesus emptied himself so that we could touch him. And here's what's even more profound is that Jesus actually came to earth on a mission to die, to wash us so that Not only can we touch God, but that we can actually house God. Jesus came so that God could get even closer to us. So that we could experience the Holy Spirit living in us because of His work. And that's worth stopping and just, again, you've heard it a thousand times. So it's like, yeah, why wouldn't He sit next to me? I'm pretty, pretty cool guy. You know, I, I, it's, it's, it's really big deal. He moved into the neighborhood. He took on flesh. He knows. He's experienced the things you're experiencing. How amazing is it that we can touch Jesus? But three things I want to talk about. I want to talk about what happens when we experience, when we encounter, when we actually touch and taste and see and actually reach out and make uh, a connection with Jesus, the first thing I want to talk about is encounters um, and our identity. Um, when we experience Jesus, when we encounter him, something shifts in our identity. Something changes. I wish I could tell you the name of the woman that we just read about. I have no idea what her name was. I mean, it could be Stacy. It could be, I have no idea what her name is. She's simply known as the woman with the issue of blood. And if you grew up in the church, probably right when I started reading the story, you started thinking to yourself, man, I've heard this story a thousand times. And we know who the woman with the issue of blood is, right? We've heard this story before. Imagine being in heaven, you walk up to some lady, you know, my name's Travis. Hey, my name's Stacy. Hey, Stacy. Well, yeah, I'm actually the woman with the issue of blood. Crazy. 
I know who you are. Everyone knows who you are. No one knows that your name is Stacy. Everyone knows that we've got a woman with an issue of blood. Listen, her issue defined her. Her identity was wrapped up in it. She's simply known as her condition. She's the lady with an issue of blood. She's lost her name. She's lost her friends. She's lost her money. She's separated from everything that she used to be connected to. Everywhere she goes, she has to declare that she's unclean. Everything she had, because I'm sure when she started to fight this disease, she had a lot. She had relationships. She had money. She maybe had a family. She had a lot of things. She started to lose those things. And sometimes issues in our lives get so close and hurt so bad that they actually start to define us. And I think anytime there's a tragedy in someone's life, there is a choice. Look, you will suffer. Jesus said it. It's really, really clear. You will suffer. The choice that you get to make is how. How you will suffer. And this woman, I'm not judging her because 12 years of chronic disease, I have no idea what she went through. But, you know, this this issue for her wasn't just developing the character of Christ in her. This issue was defining her. And she was now defined by the very thing that was destroying her. That's who she was. And some of you know what it's like to have something in your face and it's all you think about. It's all you pray about. You wake up in the morning thinking about it. You go to bed at night thinking about it and it gets so close and you just dwell on it. And because you dwell on it, you're ascribing value to it. And the things that we ascribe value to, we worship. And the things that we worship, we magnify. The things that we magnify start to get really big. And we can't see through those things or around those things. All we can see are those things in our lives. That's all we can see. You've lost sight of where God's at. And you've therefore lost sight of your identity. Right? That's why Jesus, when he teaches his disciples to pray, says this. Don't start with the laundry list. Leave the laundry list for later. Start by saying, Our Father, holy. You're holy. You're high. You're lifted up. You're separate. You're different than anything that I know. Our Father. Our Father? My Father. Maybe you're my Father. Maybe these circumstances are pressing in and I can't see straight, but maybe my Father is high, lifted up, separate, willing, able, you know? Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And it's like, okay, Jesus is like, yeah, you're warming up now. Now turn to the laundry list. And I got this bread. I need some bread, you know, like whatever. You know, it's like, don't start where you usually start. Don't start there. Because sometimes when stuff comes close, we magnify it. We can't see what God's doing in and through it. And we often dismiss something in our lives that I believe God's wanting to use to develop us. He's wanting this suffering to develop character in us, but instead it's defining us and destroying us. Here's the good news. Encounters will shift your identity. Many times in Scripture we read about people having encounters, and many times they actually literally get a new name. Naming things is very significant. When we name things, it's really profound. I mean, PR companies get paid millions of dollars just to name things. I have four daughters, and I, we're out of names. It's going to take a, a lot of work and determination to name our fifth. If it's a boy, we're good. We've got plenty of boy names. If it's a girl, I don't honestly know what we're going to name her because I'm just out of girl names. Naming things is... But as human beings, when we name things, we're just simply describing them. But when God names things, He's determining who they are. When we name things, we're just describing who they are. When God speaks, He's determining who we are. Right? He can call things as not as though they are. He can speak things into existence. 
And he's not just describing what he sees, he's determining what he's going to see. And he does it over and over again. Read uh, earlier in Mark, uh, chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus went up on a mountainside. He called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him, and, they might, and he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. There are 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boenerges, which means sons of thunder. Thunder, And we already in the first service named Jared Boenerges. So from now on, you'll refer to Jared as Boenerges. So, but here he is, he's choosing the 12, and he's not just describing who they are, because you know these guys. There's not much to these guys. He's actually determining who they're going to be. When he calls them and when he appoints them, he's not just describing, hey, Peter, you got it going on, man. I looked far and wide and I found the guy, you've, you've really, you're an all-star. That's not what he's saying to Peter. He's not just describing the reality of Peter's life. He's determining this is where we're going together. Happened for so many of our heroes, the father of the faith. He got a name change along the way. Your identity will shift. What defines you? Is there an issue in your life and it's all you can see? You know, people actually start to be known as, well, you know her, she's just like bitter. Like literally the bitterness has taken over to the point where people now describe her in that way. If you don't know someone like that, you, maybe you are that person. <laughs> and your friends are like, thank you for saying that. It starts to define you. People know you as that. What defines you? The other thing that happens when we encounter Jesus or experience Jesus, we experience him to be our remedy. This woman had, as I said, suffered for 12 years. She was losing more than blood. And she was suffering. Mark is very clear to point out to us that she wasn't just suffering from sickness. She was actually suffering from her cures. She was actually suffering at the hands of the doctors. So here's this interesting thing, and I, and I wish that I could tell you something different, but you won't experience Jesus or encounter him most likely until you're out of options. Again, sorry, but like not only do you have to be sick of being sick, which doesn't take long, after about just a few weeks, I'm totally sick of being sick. But you also have to be sick of your cures. The things that you look to to fix what's broken. The people that you turn to to fix what's broken. For whatever reason, Jesus tends to encounter and reveal himself to people who are out of options. Not only are they sick of being sick, which again, we could all raise our hand and be like, here, here, to sick of being sick, I'm sick of being sick. I'm sick of the way I deal like this. I'm sick of this. I'm sick of that. I totally hate this. But what you don't hate yet is your cures. You're not sick of the doctors that you employ to try to fix the ache in your soul. What are the things that you look to to cure? We all know something's up. We all know something's wrong. We all know that something's broken. And we're all looking to a number of things that promise us to make it right. And so, yeah, you might be sick of being sick. But are, are, are you also sick of the addiction that you turn to to try to fix the sickness? You might be sick of being sick, but are you sick of gossiping because you're getting comfort out of it? Do you think it's going to meet a need or tend to something that's broken inside of you? And here's the thing about all these doctors that we suffer from. All these things that we look to fix, what's broken in our lives, they will help you forget, but they will not fix what's going on. The Niners today will help you forget. They will not fix a darn thing in your life. 
I know that you're sick of being sick. Are you sick of the cures, the things that you run to, the things that you do? Because this lady suffered at the hands of her doctors, not just suffered from her sickness. And I don't see how that's any different than turning to a doctor when you run to something to medicate or to try to deal with the brokenness and the ache that you're experiencing. What are your doctors? Who do you call to fix the ache? What about the cures? Because you're suffering, not just from sickness, but you're suffering from your cures. The last thing uh, that I want to say, touch on this morning is that there is a responsibility for us in encountering or experiencing Jesus. What is our responsibility? And uh, what I want to say to you, church, is that we pursue in faith. And I see three things going on for this lady. She moves through the crowd. She deals with the commotion. And she actually pursues Jesus when all she can see is his back. When all she can see is his back and she's convinced that he's heading somewhere else, she still pursues in faith. And so I know that in talking about our responsibility in this or in talking about like, okay, so so yeah, all right, Trav, you had me two minutes into the sermon, great sermon, I want to experience Jesus, how about now? Or, you know, I've tried, I grit my teeth, I prayed as hard as I could, I cried, I did this tantrum thing, I still didn't get what I wanted. How do I do it? Like, how do, what's my responsibility in this? Because I think we all understand that we can't just do it, you know? So what do we do? And Mike touched on this months ago, but like, look, we're not in charge of turning on the spigot, but we can position ourselves underneath it so that when it comes on, we experience his presence. We don't just make demands or, you know, if I do this, if, you know, I'll just pray hard, I'll get louder. If I get louder, then God will come. I, you know, like that's hocus pocus type stuff. That's um, mysticism, you know. And then there are other religious ways to try to control God too. But uh, good luck with those. So, well, you know, we can't do it. So what do we do? What, what do we do? And uh, the, the first thing that I guess I want to say about pursuing in faith or our responsibility to pursue in faith is that we only need enough to come. I think that people have for years lifted up this woman as an example of great faith. And I think that she is a great example of faith, but I don't think she's an example of great faith. I don't see a woman here who's swimming in confidence. I don't see a woman here who's coming to Jesus and claiming her inheritance. I see a woman who's crawling on the dirt, saying, if I could just touch his clothes. The Greek there actually says that she's talking to herself and she keeps talking to herself. She's trying to work herself up. If I could just touch his clothes. If I could just touch his clothes. If I could just touch his clothes. This is not a person who's ready to have a, I'm going to have a face-to-face with Jesus and I'm going to claim my inheritance and healing is mine in Jesus' name. I mean, that's not where this lady is at. This lady is broken. This lady is crawling on the dirt looking to touch his cloak. Even after she's healed, she's still crying and trembling. And Jesus has to find her in the crowd and affirm her because all she's ever been publicly is shamed. And so he finds her and he actually says, Daughter, you did it. Your faith has made you, what? My faith? Yeah, yeah, way to talk yourself into it. I'm glad you kept mumbling till you did it. Your faith has made you well. My faith has made me well? I don't think when Jesus said to her, your faith has made you well, that she was like, yeah, I know. I know. I am a person of unusual faith. Extraordinary faith, you know. 
You know, I'm like a bulldog. I just go after it. You know, this is a broken, broken woman. This is a busted up lady, man. Twelve years of bleeding, 12 years of being separated from everything that she wants to be connected to. And here's the deal. In, in our culture, what we're told is that the, that, that the amount of faith that you have is more important than the object of your faith. That's what we're told. And the scriptures say something very different. The who is way more important than the how much. The who you place your faith in is way more important than the how much. How much faith did this have, lady have? Just enough to come. Just enough to come. I have a buddy. He's got faith tattooed on his bicep. I remember eating uh, Mexican food with him. I'd never seen it before. And I was like, hey, cool tattoo, faith. He, I know he's not a believer. I, I know he doesn't practice any sort of religion. And I was like, cool, faith, man. Like, faith in what? You know? And he was like, well, just faith, you know? Like, you got to have faith. And I'm like, I'm not real sure what you're talking about. Uh, I, you know, because we're being told. You're being told that what's important is, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe in. It just matters that you believe with all your heart. Okay? Well, believing in, with all your heart in unicorns is not going to help you. It doesn't matter how much I believe in unicorns. It's not going to help. I believe in leprechauns with all my heart, you know? And we're being told that that's noble. That it's noble. Well, I just, it's just faith, man. It doesn't matter what you believe. It just matters that you believe it. Like with all you got. And I understand what people are saying. And I also think that it's bull. It's not true. It's not. And what we learn from this lady is that the how much is not as important as the who. Hear me. This is, this is kind of wild. You're not saved by faith. You're saved through faith. You're saved through faith in Jesus who saves. You're not saved by your faith. You're saved through faith in Jesus and your faith connects you to Jesus. That's the role of faith. This lady pursues, there's a ton of commotion. She could have very easily sat back and resigned. Wouldn't you after 12 years of nothing going well for you? This lady pursues in faith through the crowd. I love this. I love this part of it. Because everyone is touching Jesus and no one is touching Jesus. Everybody's bumping into Jesus. Nobody's touching Jesus. Jesus goes, hey, who touched me? And the disciples go, uh, dumb question. Everyone. This is like 60s Beatles mania. This is like 13-year-old girls around Justin Bieber. He, he's being touched, right? But he's not being touched. And here's the, the sobering truth to you this morning. You can be around Jesus without touching Jesus. You can actually bump into Jesus without touching Jesus. You can be in the crowd that's around Jesus without actually experiencing Jesus. You can come to church and think you're experiencing Jesus because you're experiencing someone else who's experiencing Jesus. Well, she seems to be having a great time. Well, he looks like he's super into it. You can be a part of the crowd and not touch Jesus. And church, I want to charge you, the crowd is bigger than it's ever been here at Radiant Church. And I'm calling you to pursue Him with faith and encounter Him for yourself and experiencing Him. Press through, through the crowd. Don't sit back. Pursue in faith. That's your responsibility. Don't be content with just being a part of a group that's around Jesus. Don't be a part, of, don't be content with being a part of a crowd. Don't be a part, don't, Sorry, don't be a part. Don't be content with just simply bumping into him here and there. You have to touch him. That's your responsibility. It's not good enough to just be a part of a crowd. You've got to touch him. The other, I believe the other call in this scripture to us is that we would pursue him. Even when all we can see is his back. Jesus is on his way. 
when he gets interrupted by this lady, he is on his way to go have a face-to-face encounter with someone and heal them. That's the way healings typically go for Jesus. He'll show up. You know, he'll actually come to you having heard of your need. He actually inquires what's going on, and he heals this young girl. He's on his way to do that. He typically meets with people face to face when he's going to grant or give or do a miracle in someone's life. This lady's pursuing his back. And some of you feel in your condition and with the things that you're wrestling with like God has turned his back on you. You can still see him, but in no way would you say, like, I feel like I'm having a face to face encounter with him. My charge to you, your responsibility in faith, as we talk about encountering him and experience him, you pursue him even when his back is to you. Even when all you can see is his back and he seems to be headed somewhere else in a hurry, you pursue him. And for those of you this morning where you're feeling like, yeah, this is true for me, I, I, feel, I feel this way, I want you to specifically look at his response to this woman. I want you to take a good look at his response to this woman Because it softened my heart this week. The first thing that you should notice is not actually what he said, but that he sought her out. What in the world? He could have just kept going. There's a huge crowd of people. Someone touches them. They get healed. So what? Jesus healed thousands of people. I made that up. I don't know. Hundreds. I know that. Jesus has healed a lot of people. I'm sure he doesn't remember all their names. I'm not sure. But he's cruising along, and he seems to be kind of surprised. Power went out from me who touched me. And then instead of keeping going, because he's, he's like, no, I have to find this person. So he stops. He, again, he's going to tend to someone who's really sick. He stops. Where's this lady? Again, all she's ever been is shame. All she's ever been is separate. All she's ever been is known by her condition. He finds her and he affirms her in a way that only God can. I see your faith. I'm so glad you crawled and found me. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go free from your suffering. And I was so taken by the compassion in Jesus' voice when he says, daughter, daughter. Have you ever experienced that instant change of heart when you begin to think of someone as a son or as a daughter? Have you ever experienced that where you're kind of hard, maybe judgmental towards a person, and then you start to realize, like, that's someone's boy. That's someone's girl. There are times where I'm down here in the church office, and there's all kinds of crazy commotion going on around here, and I'm thinking, why are they doing that? And Why don't they clean themselves up? And why don't they get off the street? You know, and stuff like that. And then you you stop, and you're like, wait a second, wait a second. That's someone's daughter. That lady's someone's daughter. And not just someone's daughter. That lady is God's daughter. You know? I was up at a skate park in Portland. Famous, uh, infamous skate park in Portland. Enjoying uh, watching guys skate. And uh, I I started to notice a few girls. uh, Clearly runaways. Clearly being used by every guy at the skate park. And it just ruined my day. I was like, that's a daughter. That's someone's daughter. What if that was my daughter? That was my daughter. Just two days ago, I'm at the planing mill, the new building, and there is some guy just laying into his girlfriend, not physically, but just screaming at her. She has two kids. They're young. They're crying too. And he is screaming at the top of his lungs. And I think like this is going to get violent. So I keep like circling just to let him know like I'm here. I don't know what I'm going to do because I haven't been in a fight since sixth grade. But like, (laughs) and you've got tattoos on your face. So I was a betting man. I would uh, bet on me. I'm just circling. Hey, I'm here. This shouldn't turn, this shouldn't turn, you know, physical. And I'm just staring and I'm just thinking, this guy's a scumbag. Like you're exactly what's wrong with everything. You know, I'm just sitting there just staring at him, you know. And uh, again, tattoos on his face, just screaming at the top of his lungs while these kids cried. And all of a sudden, I started to think like, you know what? This is probably what he saw. This is probably what he saw growing growing up. Maybe he had a dad 
Maybe he had a dad who treated his mom this way. Maybe he was like one of those kids sitting in the stroller crying as his dad laid into his mom. And then all of a sudden it was like, this guy's not a scumbag. This guy's a son. This is someone's son. And instantly compassion swells in my heart. Instantly as I think about someone, like that's someone's daughter. That's someone's son. Okay? That's who we're talking about here, you know? And I just love Jesus' response to this woman. Daughter, daughter, so much compassion, so much compassion. Can I ask you this, worship team, would you come? Can I ask you this, what would Jesus say to you this morning if you got a hold of his cloak? Like let's say you were pursuing him, let's say you were following hard after him, let's say you had a little bit of faith this morning and you were actually going to grab him by the cloak and spin him around. What would he say to you? Is that what you think he would say? I mean, there, there are times, honestly, as I reflected on this yesterday, that I was thinking, like, I know this sounds ridiculous to say, but I feel at times like Jesus would spin around on me and go, hey, you know, Trav, um, hey, listen, we've got to talk about your approach. And when you approach me, I want you to approach me uh, this way. And actually, to be honest with you, Trav, I'm super busy. Right now, uh, I've been asked to do something else, and it seems to be important. But what's going on? What, what's your name again? Like, these are, they sound ridiculous. I, I swear to you, you relate to God in this way. Do you really think that's what he would say to you if you spun him around? That if you spun him around, that he would say, hey, listen, if you're going to talk to me, don't talk to me with a dip in your mouth. Hey, if you're going to pray to me, don't pray like that. Hey, listen, I've got a lot to do right now, so if you could pick it up. Is that what he would say? Or do, is, this the, is this the God you see? Is this the God you see, the one who you touch? And he actually goes, wait a second, something happened. And then he actually seeks you out and affirms the small faith that you've got and actually publicly says, man, get a load of this. This lady had faith. She pursued me. I mean, is this, is, who, who are we talking about here? Who are you talking to? What would he say to you if you spun him around? Would you stand? <laughs> Jesus. Thank you, for, um, <clears throat> thank you for revealing yourself, your character uh, to us. I just want to pray, God, I, I just, honestly, we don't want to come to the restaurant and just read the menu and never taste and see that you're good. We don't want to come and just look and read and talk about how good that must be to have a God who affirms us in that way and not experience that. Holy Spirit, I just want to ask that you do what I can. Would you affirm sons and daughters here? Would you break off an orphan spirit in us? Would you come after any idea in us that you're over us? Or that you're tired of us? And would you do and say the things that only you can do and say? Speak to our hearts in a way that would Ignite faith. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Though I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea and all the beautiful things here in life. And I